written in the ninth chapter of Matthew. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at his tax collector's booth. Follow me and be my disciple, Jesus said to him. So Matthew got up and followed him. Later, Matthew invited Jesus and his disciples to his home as dinner guests, along with many tax collectors and other disreputable sinners. But when the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with such scum? When Jesus heard this, he said, healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. Then he added, now go and learn the meaning of this scripture. I want you to show mercy, not offer sacrifices. For I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. To be still and know that you're in this place. Please let me stay and rest in your holiness. Word of God, speak. Good morning again. Welcome, everybody. Great to have you. Uh, let's play a little game of Simon Says to start off our message this morning. Yes, that game. All right. Remember, if Simon doesn't say, and you do it, you're out, okay? All right? So if I say, Simon says, stand up. Everybody stands up. All right. All right, Simon says, touch your head. Take your hand off your head. Oh, you do it, you're out. All right. Simon says, take your hand off your head. Simon says, raise your right arm, raise your left arm. Oh, got a couple more. Simon says, raise your left arm. Simon says, put them both down. You may be seated. I knew that was going to get a whole bunch of you. Simon says, you may be seated. I knew that one was going to get some people. Oh. Around the time I was in high school and I was going into college, I started feeling like the Christian life, in fact, all of religion was, the be- was beginning to feel like a giant game of Simon Says. And what do I mean by that? I mean that uh, that is how felt, uh, being a Christian felt to me, right? Um, that... I had to do these things and not do these things, okay? And if I didn't do those things or if I didn't do what I was supposed to do, then I was out, right? And, you know, it was a struggle. I didn't walk away. I stuck with it, but I began to start asking questions about it, right? I played along, right? I played along, and then I didn't like who I was becoming because here's what was happening. I started seeing people who weren't playing the game. And I started being judgmental. And I started to say, well, they need to play. Why aren't they playing? I started to see people who weren't playing, whose life was actually going far better than my life was, and I was doing the things that I should be doing. And I was like, but wait a minute, I'm playing and they're not. You see where I'm going? Anybody been there? Yeah, absolutely, right? And so I was just like, wait a minute, this, is this the way that it is? Is this the way that it's supposed to be? And sometimes I didn't know if it was okay or not. And if I didn't do what Jesus said I should do, then I was out. And let me tell you, there were some times it felt really good to be out. Because it wasn't so demanding. It wasn't so exhausting having to keep up with it all, having to wonder what was next, what, what is he going to say that I have to do or not do, right? It was the pressure of trying to do that that was so 
demanding. And finally, I felt at one point that Christianity boiled to, down to was a series of do's and don'ts. And it was a series of do's and don'ts created by a God who just wanted to make my life difficult. Anybody been there? And it was just like, oh my God, is this what it has become? And because who wants to live that life, by the way? Who wants to live that life? Right? And my faith, here's what would happen too, by the way, as I went through. It was like cycles, right? I would go along, my faith would shrivel up, April would come around, Luther Hill, Camp Luther Hill would be out on campus. I would sign up to be a camp counselor. I'd go, I'd get juiced up with Jesus, right? All summer long, all right? And I'd work there and I would decide that I wanted to get back into the game. And so I committed to praying, I committed to reading the Bible, I committed to doing everything that Jesus wanted me to do until about November. And then it started to shrivel up again. And then I started to feel exhausted again. And then guess what? April came around, I signed back up, I got back in it over the summer, I got juiced back up again, and on and on and on and on. It's kind of like when you go to a conference, right? If you've been to a conference and you get all pumped up, and you come back and you're like, guys, this is amazing and this is great, and nobody wants to play. <laughs> Are you with me? Yes. Yeah. And so on and on this cycle went. And so then I have this question as I was sitting there and I was thinking about it. What if, though? What if? I love the what if. By the way, great series on Disney+. Plus. What if? They always have these little questions. What, like, what if Captain America was X, Y, or Z, right? What if? What if we could erase everything that we knew about Jesus and we started over from scratch? And we just looked at his life in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Forget everything else. Wipe this slate clean. Just look at his life in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. What if we just would start over? What would we see? What would we see? Here's what I think we would begin to see. I think we would begin to see not a life of do's and don'ts, but a life of relationship. Because everything that Jesus did was about relationship. He was extraordinarily relational. Extraordinarily relational. And it's not just by his actions. He also talked about this relationship, this relational way of being, even in the things that he talked about. Right? He talked about relational things like a vine and a branch and how they're connected together. Right? He talked about a shepherd and a sheep, how they are connected and the sheep knows the shepherd's voice when the shepherd calls. All of that is relational language about relationships. And if we look carefully at how Jesus was with other people, we will soon find out that they, as well as all of us, are invited into a relationship with him. And so we took a look at one of these invitations. All right, several weeks ago, we started off Jesus' invitation. If anyone desires to come after me, they must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. And to that we say? Exactly. We're like, wait a minute, what? that's what he said? Yes. Right? It's an invitation for everyone. If anyone desires to come after me, anyone means everyone. The invitation is for everyone. Every one of you has gotten the invitation in your inbox. It is up to you to decide what you are going to do with it. If anyone desires, do you have a desire to follow Jesus? If anyone desires to come after me. Come after me literally means behind, right? It means to follow, right? Right? If anyone desires to come after me, that's the invitation. Do we have a desire to be in a relationship with him? And then we had these two sayings. They must deny themselves and take up their cross. And then we're sitting there and now we're going like, well, wait a minute. Isn't that a series of do's and don'ts? That kind of sounds like do and don't language to me. Doesn't it? Kind of sounds like a little bit of do and don't language. But here's what I want you to recognize. If you dig a little bit deeper... 
Deny yourself and take up your cross. If you actually go back and listen to what I talked about in that first week about denial of self and what Pastor Susan talked about last week in taking up your cross, it's about relationship, everybody. When we deny ourselves, when we deny our will and get all of the junk out of the way but that stands between us and Jesus, we strengthen the relationship. That relationship is able to be strengthened. If we put our will aside and actually focus on Jesus' will, we're in deeper relationship with him. Pastor Susan talked about taking up her cross. Taking up a cross. It, she, talked, and she literally said these words. This is about two people. You can't do this by yourself. Relationship. All right? All of those things, the last two weeks, were about how we strengthen our relationship with Jesus. They were relational topics. Jesus isn't talking about if you, ha- if you do this first, if you don't do this first, and all that sort of stuff. He's literally saying, here's how you can have a deeper relationship with me when you follow. They must deny themselves, take up their cross, and now what? Follow me. What does that mean, to follow me? What does it mean when we say we follow somebody? What does it mean that we, when we say that we're following someone or something? When we follow someone, that, that means that we're agreeing with what they're saying, <laughs> that we're going to go along with it, right? To go along with, to follow, to go along with. So it's like, oh, okay. What does it mean to follow? Well, let's take a look at what that means for all of us by looking at this invitation being given to Matthew that we heard in the text for today. All right? This invitation was extended to Matthew. As I said before, this invitation is extended to every kind of person imaginable. All right? And that invitation went to Matthew today. He was a tax collector. He was hated. He was disgusted. Okay? People hated him. Why? Because he was a tax collector. These guys, good. They they couldn't be a part of society. They couldn't be, they couldn't even go to the temple because the Jews felt that they had betrayed them. You work for Rome. You're unclean. You can't come to the temple. You're one of those people now. You can't come into the religious building. I want you to hear that. I want you to hear that. You can't come into the religious building because of who you are. Uh Uh-huh. Mmm. Somebody said, mmm. Yeah, mmm. Yeah. You can't come into the religious building because of who you are. (laughs) You don't think that still happens today? Come on. (laughs) Wake up. Wake up. Here's the way that it worked out. All right? Rome auctioned off the privilege to collect taxes all throughout, their, all throughout their empire. Who can afford the auction? Rich people, right? All right, so these rich people, they won the right to collect taxes in certain areas, in certain providences, all throughout Rome. All right? Only the rich could have these privileges. All right? Now, they could collect... You think our tax system is screwed up. Just wait. They could collect as much tax as they wanted to. There was no rate. They knew what Rome wanted, but that wasn't public knowledge. So they could collect as much as they wanted to as long as Rome got their cut. (laughs) Yeah. Right? So it was an extremely lucrative business. And so now these guys would go out to these providences, they would go out to towns and to to regions, and they would hire local Jewish people to collect the taxes. They would hire them to do this. They would hire citizens. And they would pay them so much 
it made it hard for them to say no to. Matthew's one of those people. Matthew is getting paid so much, it was hard for him to say no to. He's Jewish. That's why he's seen as a traitor. That's why he's seen as someone who's disgusting, because he basically sold himself out as a Jewish person to collect taxes for Rome. These people were hated, hated. All right? Look at Matthew 9, verse 9 again. All right? He's sitting at his tax collector's booth. All right? And Jesus comes up to him and says, follow me and be my disciple. Now, word's already gotten out. And Jesus is a popular rabbi that he, you know, that he does all these things. So he's gained some in popularity. So I would like to think that Matthew already knows who he is as he comes by his tax collector's booth. All right? And Jesus says, follow me and be my disciple. And all the disciples who are already in the back shout out in one loud unison voice. He said, what? Peter's running to the front. Hey, yo, no, 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 no. Come here. Jesus, come back here. Hold. Look, I know we need people, but no, no, just no. All right? I know we need peeps, but no. Not him. And Jesus is like, I know what I'm talking about. I know what I'm doing. Invitations for everyone. And he tells Matthew to follow. Simple. Simple. Come and follow me. I mean, come on. He could have walked up to the booth. He could have been judgmental. He would have had every right to be judgmental, wouldn't he? He sold himself to the Romans. He would have every right to walk up to him and be like, bet your mama's proud of you. Or how's this gig working out for you? Right? Uh, Jesus is a rabbi. Any harsh, disapproving thing he could have or should have said to Matthew would have been justified in terms of the culture and what's going on. But Jesus says none of that. He doesn't say any of that. Watch, church, watch. He doesn't judge. Watch, church. He doesn't say anything harsh. He simply says, follow. Because he knows if Matthew follows, it will change his life. Follow me. Begin to have your heart transformed. Enter into this relationship with me. And what does it say that Matthew does? He got up and followed. That's a simple sentence, but it's not so simple, is it, now that you know the background? Remember, he was being paid an amount he could not say no to, and he got up and left it. How many of you are willing to do the same? Everything you've been given, everything that you have, the things that are hard to say no to, you leave behind. Jesus invites him. And, and how wonderful would it be, by the way, to just put everything aside for a moment? to put everything aside, to put everything from I went to church, I read my Bible, I said the Lord's Prayer 15 times today, I put my offering into the offering plate. If we could lay all of those things aside and just ask ourselves a question, am I following? <laughs> yeah. Because that's where discipleship starts. It doesn't start with any of those other things. It doesn't start with, I went to church today. 
It doesn't start with, I read my Bible today. It doesn't start with, I said the Lord's Prayer 15 times, so I'm good for today. It doesn't start with, I'm putting this in the offering plate today. That, doesn't, that is not where discipleship starts. It starts with a simple question. Am I following? Well, the story just keeps getting better and better, doesn't it? Not only does Matthew follow, but in verse 10 it says, Hey, Jesus, let's come over to my house. Let's celebrate. Let's have a shindig. We're going to have fun. I'm going to invite a whole bunch of my other tax collectors over. I'm going to invite a whole bunch of my people over. And we'll just come and eat and have a good time. It's not just Matthew and Jesus. It's everybody else. Many other tax collectors and other disreputable sinners were with him. And here's why this is a big deal. Jesus was extraordinarily comfortable with people who weren't anything like him. And people who were nothing like Jesus were extraordinarily comfortable with him. And church, I need you to hear that. I need you to hear that. Because that is what we are called to as a church. We need to be a church where we are extraordinarily comfortable with people who are nothing like what you see in this room. And get to a place where people who look nothing like this place are extraordinarily comfortable with us. Amen? That's what we're called to do. That's what we're called to do. That's a big deal. Right? Remember, Jesus is God in the flesh. Jesus is God in a bod. God in a body. In the flesh. Based on all the sin of the world, he would have been entirely justified in making everyone in that place feel uncomfortable. He's a religious leader, and he is God. And if you are here today, and you are not a religious person, if you have questions, if you have been away from church for a while and a long time and are just now coming back or for the first time in church and you feel just a little bit uncomfortable, maybe you feel a little bit weird about what's going on. These people stand and they sit, they stand and they sit. They can't make up their minds what they want to do. I don't know what some of these words are. What are they talking about? Why do I have to repeat something back like it's the Star Wars more movie, may the force be with you and also with you what is happening here if all of that feels uncomfortable if everything feels just a little bit weird don't blame Jesus for it blame us don't blame Jesus because you are just fine in Jesus' eyes Jesus was so comfortable in his own skin that he didn't hesitate to hang out with these low lowlifes that everyone else had written off. And most of us would avoid people like that because we worry about what other people, what better people will think of us. That whole guilt by association thing. I mean, I know a pastor right now who's being pushed out of their church because they were at a pride event hanging out with those people. Come on. What are we doing? Because this is exactly what the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the Jesus' day, wondered and worried about. That's exactly what they were doing. Why are you eating with such scum? 
Why are you weird with them people? Why were you even there in the first place? I don't understand. Why are you hanging out with those people? Oh my God, what if somebody saw you? Oh my God, what if you were on television associating with those people? And then they come and they find out that you're the pastor of our church and then they come here. What happens then? Oh my gosh. I just did not expect to preach all that, but here it is, right there. It's easy for us to dismiss the Pharisees for being small-minded and intolerant, but I want you to put us in that same situation. Would we all be tempted to ask the same question? Why are you associating with such scum? Huh? Why are you choosing to hang with those people? And then in verse 12, here's how Jesus answered their question. Jesus answers their question. Healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. And I don't know about you, but I'm wondering, who are the healthy people and who are the sick people in this story? <laughs> yes? So all of a sudden he says this, and I don't know about you. Matthew's like, hey, what? What? You calling me sick? Wait a minute. I'm not sure how I feel about that. Jesus is like, Matthew, come on, you're a tax collector. <laughs> Matthew's like, you're right. High five. I'm sick. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> but as I'm looking at this, as I'm looking at this text, I'm like, I'm wondering, who are the sick people and who are the healthy people in this story? Are the sinners and the tax collectors the sick ones and the Pharisees the healthy ones? Or is it the other way around? Because when the, the truth is, when it comes to sin, we are all sick. Amen? Amen? We are all sick. We are not even consistent with keeping our own rules, much less God's rules. Amen? <laughs> Deep down, we all know that if our relationship with God depends on how we keep the rules, we are all in trouble. We're all in trouble. And I'm here to tell you the good news for all of us, Jesus changed it all. Amen? Amen? Jesus changed it all. He changed it all. He shared meals with sinners. He met with those people. He showed that it was okay. He showed that it didn't matter. He showed that guilt by association should not matter to you. He showed that very, very truly we should be comfortable with people who are not like us. He didn't pretend that anybody was better than anyone else. Jesus says this. He says to the Pharisees, I want you to go and I want you to think about this passage of Scripture. And the Pharisees are like, oh, okay, what passage of Scripture? And he quotes Hosea. He quotes the prophet Hosea in 913. He says, I want you to go and I want you to learn the meaning of this. I want to show mercy not offer sacrifice. I want you to show mercy, not offer sacrifice. He said, for I've come to call not those who think that they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners and are far away. Jesus invited those who were far from God to experience the love of God. By what? By following him. He wasn't content to just be with people who believed all the right things. Or behaved in the right ways. It's not enough to believe right. It's not enough to behave right. Because Christians who are content with stopping at believing right and behaving right, will become Pharisees. Because here's what Pharisees say. Pharisees say, change and you can come and join us. Jesus says the opposite. Jesus says, I need you to follow me and I will change you. Amen? Amen. Follow me and I will change you. Jesus called people from all walks of life, just like he does today. Maybe you gave up on church one time in your life. Maybe you thought about giving up church here recently. Maybe you did so, or maybe you thought about it. 
all right, because you grew up in church or you grew up in a religious system that was all about playing a game of Jesus says. And you just weren't good at it. You weren't consistent. You didn't have the discipline to be whatever it was that religion says you had to be. And so you quit. Or you cling desperately to your faith, but right now you find no joy in it whatsoever. I am here to tell you right now, the great news, the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ is that Jesus says, follow me. He knew that if they just followed, if they just took a baby step, if Matthew just stood up and took that first step from that tax collector booth, it would change him forever. So no matter who you are, no matter where you've come from, no matter where you're going, Jesus' invitation for you is to follow him. And all you got to do, baby, take that first step. In Jesus' name. And all God's children said, amen. amen. Let's stand and sing our next song.
Baptism train.